Okay. Me too. So starting. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, September 17th. I'm Larry Rhodes, or DJ Doubter 5, and as usual, we have our co-host Wombat on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Ahoy! Stealing just a little <laughs> bit of the thunder from our own Dread Pirate Higgs, but I'm glad you And back. ahoy, Dread Pirate Higgs. <laughs> Arr, there, there it is. is a proper pirate <laughs> proper pirate a proper yeah. pirate <laughs> digital free thought radio hour is a talk radio show about atheism free thought rational thought humanism and the sciences and conversely we'll also talk about religions religious faiths pastafarianism gods holy books and superstition and if you think you're the only non-believer in your town well you're just not here in Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, where you think we wouldn't have any, we have a group of over a thousand of us, card-carrying members. We're the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, and we'll tell you more about us after the mid-show break, so be sure to stick around. Wombat, well, what's our topic today? I want to talk about uh, people becoming ornaments, uh, uh, leading into a conversation about gender. I want to talk about unity and how they're now charging more people as if corporations don't necessarily have the best interests of its consumers and how that actually applies to religion and how religion can also operate as a corporation as well. And then if we got time, I want to talk about a new word that I came up with and we'll see uh, the three criteria that make you that particular word. But before we get into the meat and potatoes of today's show, how about a dish of pasta led to us by our own Dread Pirate Higgs? Arr! God be me, Captain, I shall not want. He maketh me to float in salt water. He steereth me through glassy seas. He filleth me bowl. He steereth me through the straits of noodliness, for goodness sake. I, mm. though I sail through the heaving of tempestuous waters, I will fear not sinking. For thou art with me, thy mast and thy rudder, they comfort me. Thou preparest a feast before me in the presence of me mates. Thou quenchest my thirst with grog. Mm. My goblet runneth over. Truly, pasta and grog shall abide with me all the days of me life, and I shall dwell in the galley of the quab forever. Raw, Raw man. man. Fantastic. Mm. <laughs> I love it. Hey, Dread, <laughs> you will Arr. be very happy to know that Netflix has come out with a new show called One Piece, a live action version of a popular manga series that's out that's about pirates oh. and the, and the problem is is previously netflix has had a very bad track record from adopting comic books particularly japanese comic books into live action dramas however okay. this at this time this time it's unanimously approved as like a quality transition from the comic uh -huh. show and i can tell you maybe the key point was pirates because everybody loves okay. pirates not necessarily everybody loves space cowboys or emos or demons but pirates everybody can get behind that and they found like a really good way to just showcase hey we're just really? having fun. It's pirates. It's and, pirates and what's the name of the show one piece one piece, one piece. Okay. yes you'd love it for world building i mean i think it'd be actually something that you'd get behind though okay uh, i'll check it out the it is i'll see if is, we can put the uh pasta fairing improv tour on it <laughs> it's a piratey it's a piratey uh comic book like there's just okay. there's Peace. i mean there's sea creatures there's a lot of shivering me timbers there's a bunch of mm -hmm. pirate stuff you i think you like ours okay and... well i'm gonna have yeah. to write that down it's here. on netflix you can check it out i'd recommend that it's uh, only okay. eight episodes but one piece uh the netflix season and it's already been greenlit for a season two which is like so um, piece as in piece of eight correct yes okay. one piece i left everything in one piece that's what it'd be called. gotcha okay larry rhodes what is oh i'm sorry dread how have you been though uh how what's up with you doing well we uh we had our uh church uh agm um on friday so Fantastic. uh we've got uh you know reestablished our our officer rank and our crew are all together and we've got a bunch of stuff we're moving along with, Fantastic. um, including, um, a pro bono lawyer, uh, representing Ooh. me in my quest to, uh, get my ID with ICBC. So Did very, you... very positive stuff. 
you know, if you just hang out at a dog park, I'm sure you can find more pro bono lawyers, right? Or like maybe a butchery, just be like, hey, who loves bones? I do. Are you a lawyer? I am. We can hang out. We can hang out. <laughs> Larry, we'd love to check in with you. <laughs> By the way, don't mind this random cough I got. I, I had COVID for the last, mm. uh, about two weeks ago, I had COVID. I was thankful that I got vaccinated because my symptoms were fairly mild. However, I do have this like nagging case of u- uvula-itis, which is just like some slight inflammation in the back of my throat. That's it. Non-productive cough. Tested myself yesterday. In fact, I'm still negative, so... Just don't mind me if I got this weird little coughing. Good. But Larry, checking in with you. How you been, my friend? I'm doing fine. I'm not riding my motorcycle or anything. My knee is really killing me. I'm going to see a doctor this Wednesday, though, about possible surgery. Who knows? I'll be on crutches in a few weeks. But okay. Toward a uh, road to recovery. Yeah. Uh, speaking of weird roads of recovery, my mom recently had a toenail surgery. And so I wake up now to notifications that are like your mother has contacted you and I tap it. And it's just this weird picture of like half a toe that has (laughs) like cuts in it because she's showing me Uh. steadily healing. I know. Right. I know. Right. And so (laughs) she's just asking like, Hey, is this looking good? Or is it like too much pus? Or is it, why is my skin? Why is like, mom, your band-aids are too tight. Let, let it like, dry up Circulate. a little bit. yeah 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 and i'm just like every day i wake up to that but i i it's you know it's it's who else could you show it to than your own family so it's one of those things but she she's doing well she's on the path to recovery too guys wanted to talk about uh some hot topics we'll have a quick lead through on gender today and i think what we could do is probably define what it means to us before we talk about it in detail and then i'll lead it up to dread pirate higgs and i'll i'll throw out my hat um i don't know what gender how the word is used in most popular sense today because it seems to be a lot of contrasting opinions even among people who handle that term as like a very if even for people who think that term is very important i don't hear a consensus on what it means and so as a result i don't i don't want to i don't want to identify or claim knowledge on something that seems to be a, something transformed to something that's still very ambiguous. I do know when I was a kid, gender was just the more polite form of saying sex that you would have on like forms or policies for like people who didn't want to have yeah. the word sex on the <clears throat> document. They would put gender right. to be a bit more polite. Right, right. Correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it means a completely different thing. And so I'm not, I recognize that these don't mean the same thing anymore, but I don't think there's any consensus on what gender means. And I also don't like what it's attempting to define because I think that is inherently tied to society and culture as it is today. Or so like what it meant to be a woman today, a woman today, gender woman today is completely different than what it meant 50 years ago. And so like today I woke up to try to figure out the pay-per-view results of a UFC fight with, that was headlined by two women fighters, two female athletes that fight each other in a cage. Like that concept would have been completely foreign to what it meant to be a woman 20 years ago, 10 years ago, compared to now where it's just, oh, no, that's a normal thing. And maybe they'll have a trilogy fight uh, later on, or maybe there'll be a bunch of other female fighters. Like the idea of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man seems to be steeped in culture and very fluid. And so as a result, I don't understand why we're coming up with labels to define stuff like that. But that's me just me i'm just me i don't personally put a lot of weight into the label dread or or larry what do you think the idea of gender is well yeah in today's society it's kind of a loaded question Mm -hmm. Uh, i know what gender roles are i know Mm -hmm. that uh, you can be one gender or sexual uh, physiology but identify as a different one Uh, it's it's more fluid today than it's ever been in, in human history but i think that we need to endorse it and and embrace it because it's who people are it's what makes them happy it's what it what allows them to love the person that they love um you know it does it's it's more about what you're attracted to you can't change what you're attracted to or how you feel inside Uh, i mean we have tried it as a society to change that um as punishment as legal punishment you know we, you are going to be reassigned your gender uh, because of this court trial. And it's always failed. It's always had horrendous results. 
and we need to reconcile the fact that we need to recognize what people are and how they feel and how they who they love. And Dred, before we get in, before I get to you, could I just address a quick comment from from Larry? So, like, I want to just make a big distinction between sex and gender because I mm -hmm. don't want to conflate the two. I do think they are two different things. However, when someone is assigning, when you say like someone was assigned the wrong gender as a baby, I don't know if doctors are in the business of assigning gender or if they are assigning sex. Like they right. will get a- Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they will assign a sex. Like this baby is male, this baby is female. Well, they don't like, really have anything else to go on. They don't have, they, I don't know if you're going to like guitar music or if you're going to like mm -hmm. ballet. I don't know that. I can't assign your gender, but I can't assign your sex. And if the kid yeah. disagrees, it's like, maybe you disagree with the societal add-on that they put onto sex, which is gendered, and you want to be a different gender. It's like, it's totally fine. But as far as what your sex is, that might be a different conversation. Like that might be- I remember, I remember as a, as a young boy, I was asking my mother, how, how do we, how does the doctor know what, what sex the baby is when they put it on the form? Well, they look, they look. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make it just sure shocked like, me. <laughs> you have a right. You have a right to be whatever gender you want, but I think like right. there's consequences that that comes with what sex you are, and that might like affect yes. like what you can participate in, uh, what pills you need, what kind of medical checkups you need to go to, like what diet, what sort of way we need to make sure that you can stay healthy and and viable in society, etc. Um, Gary, what do you think, or what do you think gender is and the add-ons that I put on? Sorry about that. Are you talking to me? I'm talking to you, Dred. What do you think? Oh, gender oh, is? I see. I I've got my name wrong here. Oh, I got. It. <laughs> um, <laughs> here, you want uh, to fix it for you? Yeah. So, yeah, if you don't mind, uh, no. hey, uh, yeah. So, you know, sex in these words all are context de uh, context dependent. Yes. So, depending <laughs> on the context in which you're having the conversation, will uh, dictate the way in which you use these these terms. Mm. and the meanings that are associated with them certainly sex in uh in the common language i think is biological mm. right so you just think about in ten thousand years when uh anthropologists and archaeologists are digging up your bones yes how would you be identified and mm. it isn't by what you clothe yourself with or how you act or your mannerisms or or the your there's inflections in your speech or the kind of language you use. It's your biological construction, Physi physiological, your physiological attributes, makeup. Yes. And, yeah. and that will determine whether you're one or the other. Um, gender, of course, is nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, and I agree with Larry that um, we need to, uh, you know, embrace the idea that gender and sex are different. But at the same time, not make it um, sort of a, a primary characteristic of what a person is. Yes, on, you know, well deep said. down, well it, it says it's super. You know, because again, you know, like <laughs> even a, a person's color is the least interesting thing that you could consider about a person. And I exactly. think gender is kind of the same thing. Like, mm. you know. I, you know, it doesn't matter to me because yeah. I'm not in that kind of a relationship with that person. If I just meet someone on the street, I'm not really concerned about what their gender is mm. or their color or their sex. You know, it's, uh, you know, and I think we have to get over that, um, that uh, sort of uh, reliance on these rather uh, superficial Arbitrary identifiers right yeah mm -hmm. can i can i can i it's like hair color who cares let me address uh one thing i think there might be a better word that we can find so like i always considered sex to be a descriptor like i'm just describing someone so like if someone said hey who stole your car i don't say well it's a person that values classical <laughs> guitar music and right. uh, I don't want to make it. It's like, just, just describe them. I'm not telling you to identify the person. I just want a description so that we can objectively look for a person that looks like this description. They're wearing a red shirt. That's a man. And it's a man. It's like, or it's a male. Whatever yeah. you want to say. These are Whether he prefers uh, Jean-Paul Sartre 
or uh, Kant yes. as a philosopher. Who cares? Right. But right? I might identify as things that aren't necessarily what I'm described as. So, like, I might be yes. a person who identifies as a Foo Fighters fan or yeah. uh yeah, someone that's that exactly enjoys... exactly what i mean yeah yeah exactly or someone that likes you know i don't know electronic music or a playstation over xbox like these might yeah. be things i identify as or sort of, chevy sort of... who cares and they describe sort of like my identity but not as my dis physical description right yeah. and so i see sex as a describer of my physical state my biology right and i see yeah. gender as sort of like the identifier like what do you identify past just your your basic attributes that we can objectively assess like tell me tell me more about you i want to learn about you and i think if we understood it like that it'd make it's a lot easier for me to wrap my head around what gender is because then of course you can be there's going to be so many different kinds of genders and different ways that people relate to them when they used to be things that we embrace and try to work towards learning about each other but mm. i i think the value of it is when you separate it from sex because yes. i think some of the confusion or the problems that i have with some of the debates that are going on is in times when it's convenient, they overlap to problematic circumstances. And then other times they're completely separate only when it's also convenient too. And I'm like, dude, if they are separate terms, keep them separate identity description. That way the realm of biology can just stay consistent with descriptions. And we can just say, Hey, these are, this is what sex is. This is how we understand it, how it works. This is how we can test it. This is how we can prevent certain diseases that are predominant in certain different kinds of sexes. Mm -hmm. These are intersex people, and this is also valid, and we don't have to change them one way or the other. There's just another state of sex, and we can better understand this as a science practice, and it doesn't reduce people or make them less valid. But gender could just be its own you know, psychological, uh, interpersonal, get-to-know-you sort of thing, and let that just be a separate realm that's not the same thing. That would be my meaningful variables that's the only thing i i would fight for mm -hmm. yeah, it's like uh, you know whether you're a catholic or an episcopalian you know it's it's how you identify yourself not mm -hmm. how you're objectively identified hey that's the best i wouldn't way be able to tell the difference yeah exactly. you couldn't tell the differences if they were in a lineup a police right. lineup <laughs> yeah maybe yeah. like gender is how you express he looks like a catholic <laughs> Sex is how other right. people can identify you. It's like sex is right. how other people identify you. Gender is how you identify yourself or express yourself. That, yes, that's yeah, way exactly. Yeah, I like that. Dread, you had made a comment of people becoming ornaments. What did you mean by that? Well, I guess, you know, using these uh, superficial identifiers as the substance of your being, <laughs> you know, or, you know, somehow that it that it is, uh, you know, directly correlated to who you are as a person mm. Um, mm. you know i you know even people like who who uh you know where sort of appearance is overtaking substance yes. as a key factor yeah and how people are represented or present yeah. themselves well the things that jump to my mind when you say people as ornaments uh, is trophy wives something like that is that what you have in mind Almost no, sometimes. no, not specifically. I'm talking more about people who make themselves ornaments, who oh. like the diamond encrusted cross that pe people or are to, or like, tattoos or you know just that uh, rely much more on the superficial aspects of their person mm. rather than developing a, a deeper, I uh, I guess more interesting interior person intellectually or more uh, honest complex, or as opposed yeah. to just superficially more complex. more real dread yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's a good point you know it's on. just it just seems to me that you know and you know of course as everyone gets older they say about the younger generation but you know it just uh, it seems to me that people rely much more just on these superficial qualities hmm. as the things by which they believe they should be judged as opposed to anything of more intellectual substance. Mm. Larry. Well, it seems that today's society is kind of pushing us in that direction as yeah. Our, yeah. our interactions are more fleeting, like on, on the internet or in person, you know, we see each other for a little while and then move on that it becomes more important uh, to, to rely on outward signals than 
internal uh, honesty, integrity, and, and oh, I like it, Larry, and all that. Yes, that, that that's that's good. Because I like the, the person may never have the time to learn the right. through you. Well, you everybody has thirty thousand friends. You know, everyone right. has thirty thousand, ten thousand friends. <laughs> right. Like, I can't. I don't have time for everybody. You know, yeah. my thing on top of it to go on Dread Story was I once went to Sweden to a metal festival, and I like metal music. And I would say, like, I'm pretty good at having, like, my favorite kinds of bands and different genres of metal, because there's not just one kind of metal. But I didn't bring any my, I don't have any metal regalia, and I didn't bring any, like, black t-shirts with me. So, like, I'm there working at, like, a lab, and so I only have, like, my dress shirts and, like, my normal slacks. And mm -hmm. I go to a metal festival for, that's, like, a three-day festival where there's just people with face paint. They got the spikes, they got the black shirts, they got tattoos, and I'm there in my dress shirt. <laughs> it's like, right. And I felt, I felt everyone was super mm -hmm. cool, but I felt like one, I'm not even like in, from this country. And then two, it's like when the metal people are like, they're like, they're singing in Swedish, which is like the perfect language for metal music. Like, oh, who's, who's you guys are animals today? And I'm like, yeah, I'm an animal. And everyone's just like, okay, <laughs> he's hanging out with us. He went, but the idea of like not looking the part. We're not having the mm -hmm. accessories. Like I yeah. probably enjoy that music mm -hmm. just as much as everybody else, but I didn't have the the accessory limit to demonstrate that. I didn't okay. ornament myself. Would you say that's sure. applicable? Um, so I'm actually I I think I'd go a little deeper because okay. uh, like Jean Paul Sartre, he he talked about authenticity, being your authentic self, mm. and when you're not, he called it bad faith, and he made the example of a waiter who has never waited a table in his life before, but is dressed like a waiter, uh, tries to act like a waiter, tries to carry the trays like a waiter, but isn't a waiter. And that is bad faith. So he's so not he's, working he's at not, the store? He's not being authentic to who he is on the inside. He's an ornament. He's pretending to be something on the outward show that he isn't on the inside. Is it like stolen? And that's, and that's what I mean by people becoming ornaments is that they're ornaments to themselves. I see. They have an outward show that mm. doesn't actually reflect who they are on the inside. And I think uh, Larry hits it on the head here with social media and the, and the f sort of fleeting um, encounters that we actually mm -hmm. have to sure. connect with one another um, is that we just do our best to make a, a first impression Sure. without giving any thought to how it actually reflects who we are mm. on the inside i got it's it sounds respect so it sounds also sounds to me like stolen valor to a point where people who dress up like military people because they in their minds want to be perceived as a hero though they right. don't realize the harm that they want people from. saying thank you for your service yeah just so they can that feel kind of thing about themselves, yeah, yeah. but not yeah. necessarily earn it and right. diminish the value of the people who have made that sacrifice, which I find yeah. harmful. Yeah. Um, I would say this. I'm going to throw one uh, more thing. Um, on the idea of gender, I do feel like we have social norms that we apply to attributes and that we've either masculinized or feminized them. And I feel like that is something that evolves over time but is also inherently sort of like meaningless because we know it's a social construct. When I hear people say, um, I identify as this separate gender, I'm only seeing them point to another arbitrary basket of social uh, contrivances. And in my mind, it would be like, listen, if you're a guy and you want to paint your nails, you can be a guy that paints your nails. Like, that is that is that it should be something that's just in everyone's basket like that shouldn't necessarily be a feminine thing that should just be a thing that you want to do with your fingernails yeah. i don't think it makes you yeah. any less masculine to paint your nails or like other men or i don't know rollerblade or or want to be a stay at home dad like whatever whatever weird contrivances that we put in the masculine feminine box i feel like we should just stop looking at those boxes and just let it be more freely distributed as far as traits go because we know we have great female athletes we know have we know we have great dads that can stay home we mm -hmm. know uh we have great managers we know we have female doctors that are great we know we have great men nurses like all these weird 
lines in the sand that we built up, I find stifles social progress. And so when people start uh, generating genders and saying like these are real things and this is what this gender means and it has these attributes and this or, is what and then they means. start throwing the word should around this is what this gender should be like yeah this is what this right. gender should do you know uh, i find that roles i find that silly but i do appreciate that we're having the conversation because i'm hoping that the conclusion that we'll reach is that this is silly we shouldn't be saying that men shouldn't be nurses or only women can be this degree or all these little attributes only females can be ballerinas like none of this makes sense like this we yeah. should just conclude that this is silly maybe we should either come up with new definitions or usages of gender or get rid of the ones or these these ideas that we have because they're prejudiced and biased as well and that's not moving us any forward that would be my yeah. thought process what do you think dread I, w- I would agree absolutely and if when people pigeonhole people into these sort of uh, roles Again, it really speaks to uh, inequality, and if mm. and if we're all really interested in equality, then we have to kind of let go of those, uh, uh, you know, um, those biases, right? We have to be able to really, truly say and and, and take it into ourselves that um, we have to look past that superficial, you know, just consider it a superficiality, yeah, and, and move on. Yeah, you know what like, I mean? Like, yeah, very I could I could completely know someone's gender and still not know if they're a good person or if they're a person worth hanging out. Precisely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Those aren't yeah. qualities that make or break a person on the inside. It's mm. it's who they are on the inside, and that's what yeah. we should be looking for. <clears throat> yeah. Society as a whole says uh, it's on the ins- it's what's on the inside that counts. But then it turns hip- hypocritical <laughs> when they yeah. they judge you by what's yeah. on the outside. Yeah. Right. I like intentions and actions. How about that? Let's judge people Mm -hmm. based on those two things. And let's move everything down to just descriptors because that's all there is at the end of the day. You know, like let's not identify ourselves with our ornaments. Larry, any final thoughts? And would you mind taking us out? Well, not final, but this is the break. (laughs) Okay, that's good timing because I'm just going to grab my dog. (laughs) Okay, Okay. this is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Dr. Five, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's take just a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK has uh, was founded in 2002. We're in our 21st year and have over a 1,000 members. We have weekly in-person meetings here in Knoxville every Tuesday evening at Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Tap Room in Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high-top table or if it's pretty weather outside on the deck. Just go out on the deck, turn left, and go to the end of the deck. You can find us online at Knoxville's, I mean, sorry, at Facebook, meetup.com, or knoxvilleatheist.org. You can also just Google us on as Knoxville Atheist. It's just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one. Start Start one. one. Right. Wombat, where do you want to pick up? I want to talk about corporations and religions, and maybe there's some ties between the two. So recently, there's been an uproar with a gaming engine company. A game engine is essentially a program that makes video games. And there are a lot of popular ones out. One of the most popular is called Unity. Unity is a game engine that allows creators to be able to make video games that can go on consoles, PCs, etc. And in fact, if you've played video games, if you played video games in like, I don't know, in the last 17 years, guaranteed you have played at least a couple of Unity games. If not, a majority of the games that you played have been on the Unity platform. Now, here's the weird thing. Unity is a $12 billion company. They have a lot of profits. However, like companies do, they always want more profit. And so they found a really good way to make more money, which is to charge the developers, not just for the cost of their game engine subscription, not just for a little bit of revenue from every game that's sold, but also a new fee that just came out a couple of weeks ago that charges the devs for every single time one of their customers installs the game, they will be charged 20 cents per game install. Now think about this. If I have 
a game that I downloaded from Unity and I have it on my PC and I install it, a developer gets charged 20 cents. And if I take that same game and uninstall it and reinstall it again, maybe like three months later, because I was just rearranging software on my computer, they get charged another 20 cents. And if I install that on another computer because I own the game and I just want to play it on two different PCs, maybe I have one in my living room, one in my bedroom, they get charged another 20 cents. If I stole the game, if I pirated the game, which I I, tr I don't do, I try not to do, but I also don't do it anymore. I used to do it a bunch of times when I was a little kid, but now I don't anymore. If I install a pirated game, no offense to Pirates Dread, that, dread, that developer <laughs> also gets charged 20 cents. The money all goes to Unity. And it seems so counterproductive. <laughs> I mean, to, to charge your developers, I mean, right. to ding them every time your game is installed. Think about I, this. And think about it. Okay, there, there could be dozens of developers on a single game. Do they charge them all 20 cents oh, per that's installation? I, that's a good question. I don't know that. But I do know this. If I make a free game that's like a tutorial or just like I'm a YouTuber and I make free games for people, I will get charged for every single time someone installs that game. Right. There's a uh, lot. It's counterproductive. I can bankrupt myself. This will not stand. Right. So, <laughs> so that was the initial message that came out. And since then, Unity has made some clarifications and, and regressions saying like, listen, okay, in order for us to charge you, you have to make at least $200,000 in the last month and have $200,000 or 200 installs. And they're trying to like make tiers. So where people who make free games don't get necessarily charged people who buy games as a charity bundle don't get charged don't charge the developers they're trying to make it so that they can still keep the rule but there's still that fee that didn't necessarily improve their product or uh, or was in the best interest of their consumers what do you think larry well you're talking about a game development engine right yes as versus the people who are writing the game Correct. using that engine now Correct. it depends on how you define the word developer Bethesda is a developer. It's Correct. a corporation. Mm -hmm. Now, if if they charge, uh, if um, Bethesda uses their engine to develop a game, and then they sell games and they all, and people install them, I can understand that the people who develop Unity would want like twenty cents per installation from the developer, meaning the corporation who puts the game out. So maybe it's a misunderstanding of who the quote developer is that we're talking about here. So what's unfortunate is it is that one, if I was a one person in my bedroom and I was making a video game, I would be the developer. It's it's, and if Bethesda is a corporation, they're still the developer. They'd still be charged. if They're using a unity product. What's sad though, is what people would, would rather have is a revenue share system where it's once you buy the game from that money, a percentage of that money will go to unity rather than put me in a situation right. where I may not be making any money on my game right now, but if 14 million people in reinstall the game for whatever reason, maybe I announce the sequel and a lot bunch of people want to play the first game and they reinstall it on their computers. Now I have this $50,000 fee that I had to pay out of nowhere just because I announced a new game that came out. So like it puts me in a precarious situation where I don't get an influx of money and unit gets a percentage of it. I just get charged money. And right. the bottom line is this is not a fee that enhances the product. It's not a fee that suddenly gives me more value as a developer or as a consumer of their product. I am stuck with this tax that in an ecosystem that I can't escape without a lot of work on my end. And they know that that's why they can charge it. It's not in my best interest. So yeah. my thought process would be, do you know what also is in your best interest? <laughs> do you also know any large organizations that operate not necessarily in the best interest of their consumer? <laughs> and I thought, isn't this sound a lot like religion? Because there's a big upheaval on the idea of unity, but no one's talking about how Christianity has never offered a product for anyone to to uh, physically have or tangibly experience. Mm -hmm. Yet they still yeah. charge money. They still charge your identity. They still want uh, your kids to go to their Sunday schools. They still want to inhibit science. They still want to tell you not to get vaccinated. They still want to tell you what politicians to vote for. There's a lot of social taxes that come with belief in a religion, a lot of fees that come with it that are both monetary, time-based, and social-based, and there's no enhanced value. When Jesus says, right. "Hey, listen, I need you to tithe," why didn't any of his followers be like, "And what we're going to get in what will we get additionally in return? 
yeah mm-hmm. with additional signs like well you get uh eternity next to the right s- side of my guy right. my my dad's mm-hmm. like yeah that's what we had before but now you're asking us to tie so like we're gonna get more stuff right <laughs> Where yeah, is after you die name? Yeah, what added value are you bringing to this? Yes, right. with all these additional charges, not only that, but like with the rate of inflation and the number of people who are working and the more money you should think you'd be getting, I think I'd at least get another product, at least a, Vi- a Bible mm. 3.0. Like, can yeah. can we get some miracles on demand? Like, I'm still praying. Like, come on, can we, can we come up with some sort of enhanced value for the customer? Because my return on investment is only further depleting. Like, <laughs> what do you right. think, Larry? Well, I think that uh, I'm going to try to offset some of the customer comments going forward. Uh, it, you know, that they're going to say, well, it's voluntary. You know, you don't, you know, going in that you'll have to do this. You know that uh, uh, the, what the fees are and, and what you're expected of you before you join the club. Mm. That's not true for not children. True. Mm, very you know, true. The, the people that, that uh, inherit the, uh, the ideas, the, the methodologies, the costs, uh, without any benefits from it until after they die. And the guilt is a large cost of it too. Of course, of course. But um, it's it's not an entirely voluntary thing. And if it were, hey, I wouldn't worry about it. As long, you know, wait till the person is 21 years old, pitch your, your religion to them if they want to join, not a problem. Right. Not only that, but like, I feel like it's a violation of the spirit of a terms of service. You know, so think about it like this. If I was charged, if Apple came out suddenly and said, for every Apple product you have in your home and on your person, we will charge you $1 per month. So if you have three iPhones in your family, we're just going to charge you $3. That's our new terms of service. And be like, why are you charging this new fee? It's like, because if you don't like it, you can go to a different phone. It's like, well, I've already bought, I bought into a yearly contract for this phone. I can't necessarily swap it out, but I bought into it with the understanding that I wouldn't be charged this additional fee. So like you've sort of adjusted your terms of service that breached the contract that we started, which was the understanding that I wouldn't be charged these additional fees. When developers bought Unity, they didn't know this fee was going to come down, you know, today. And they're still mm-hmm. stuck on the hook for a project that won't be out for another four or five years where they may have to sell a product that incurs them a fee that reduces their bottom line at the end of the day. Like they don't want that either. With the Bible, hey, listen, this is our God. This is your path to salvation. You, it sounds great. You're going to have some potlucks. You're going to meet some great people. We're going to have great moral uh, <laughs> privileges. We'll feel a lot better than everybody else when you chose people. It's like, great. You buy into it, but then there's that the baggage of hell. There's the baggage of evil. There's the baggage of guilt. There's the baggage of now I have to discriminate against against people who don't necessarily believe the same things I do. I have to okay. choose the schools. I have to take my kids. I have to hate gate. I have to depending on the church I go to, hate gay people or accept them, but only them and not their sin, right? Like I have to like start parsing people from things that are part of their authentic selves and and come up with these arbitrary bifurcations of people instead of taking them as their full authentic selves. It's, it's a terms of service that you weren't sold into, but is the bait and, and switch of a lot of religions. Um, Except for Pasifarianism. I feel like Pasifarianism is pretty cool with that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would agree. Pasifarianisms are an exception to that. Yeah. Um, we're, we're the new religion, right? We don't, you know, we don't demand anything. I mean, that's it's a dogma free religion, fortunately. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can take it or leave it. Like they say, we, don't have to ba- we have the God bag guarantee. Uh, you know, <laughs> rise up for 30 days. If you don't like it, your old God would probably take you back. So, mm. <laughs> dogma and all. So, I, I had something on my mind. I, uh, it, hopefully, it'll come back because okay, it, it really hit the point here. Feel free, feel free to interrupt any of your time. But I would say, like overall, the agreement that was made at the start, the one that I signed up for, isn't what I'm being offered. Let's go ahead, Dred. Yeah. So um, it's interesting that actually that people actually develop this behavior themselves it's not necessarily that a company is trying to do it um for instance you know people whose uh, product loyalty uh, tends to you know go over the top you know i'm a ford man Mm -hmm. uh, you you chevy jerks you know you all drive pieces of crap you know like people actually are they have a a proclivity for for being loyal to products so right 
um, I think companies, of course, can exploit that yes. uh, proclivity and uh, and and then charge for it. And yes, of course, religion is very much that way, right? Right. You don't you don't go into the religion saying, uh, "I'm a Catholic. I'm going to hate Protestants." You go in the Catholic and you buy into the culture, and then you get ensconced in you know what's going on in that religion, and it creeps in. It, right. It's that slow creep of all the other attendant values and ways of thinking that mm. suddenly you're a different person at the end and don't even recognize that the change has occurred in yourself. Very true. So true. In fact, I like to, I want to, I want to highlight a point. If you ever, if you ever look at a hemi cut or a half cut cross-sectional cut of a human brain, you will see essentially a, a central core that looks very different than what's on the outer surface. So like when you think of a brain, you think of this pink uh, wrinkly surface. That's the outer part of your brain. There is a core to your brain that's very consistent with like other animal kinds yes. of brains. And yeah. the, the reason why we have these two kinds of structures of brains is because we have evolved on top of like our old historical brains. So yeah. like we have like a reptile brain. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. When yep. we say reptile brain, we're not literally saying we have a, a literal reptile brain in our head. We're just saying we have like a prehistoric fundamental brain stem that we've added on additional functionality to, sort of like adding on additional chips to a computer or like yeah. a new engine. Into Which a is system. generally how uh, evolution works. Right. Yeah. We're adding on that gives like us modular to have these like higher ambitious, more arbitrary, ambiguous conversations about uh, nuanced topics empirically. Right. But. The thing is that core brain is still capable of doing some thought process and affecting how the rest of the brain works. So when it comes to things like, is this a danger or am I safe? Is this a good thing to eat or is it a bad thing to eat? Does it taste good? Does it not taste good? Like all those core functions are still there in our brain. And when a corporation's like, how can we sell our product to more people? Should we sell our car based on the idea of how many airbags there are? Uh, or, you know, what our fuel efficiency is or stuff like that? Or can we just have our truck run through the desert and be like, you're a big man, you're strong, you need a Ford truck. That's yeah, right. put a naked, uh -huh. put a ha scantily clad woman in the backseat of that car. Now the lizard brain's firing. It's like, we need this. Your lizard brain's inside your brain being like, hey, we need the car that does that. It's like, what well, we only yeah. drive to work and back. It's like, yeah, but this driving the desert and there's a pretty lady in the back and that means we can have yeah proclivity to have more kids which is good and it looks safe it looks safe there's no there's no predators around any backseat is big <laughs> enough to have sex in. yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like corporations know what it takes to get us on board with things that aren't even necessarily in our best interest and they have fine-tuned their marketing specifically to get through to that that fleshy wrinkly part of our brain back to the lizard brain and i yeah. don't see a difference when it comes to religion I find like religion operates on the same marketing values of like the tobacco industry of like the alcohol industry It is targeting you. Do you feel uncomfortable? Do you feel sleepy when you wake up? Do you feel like you're not, do you, you could know more people? Well, let me help you connect with more people, potentially find more mates, make you feel more safe. Mm -hmm. And and give you that one salve, which is you're going to die one day. Wouldn't it be great if you did not Wouldn't it be great if death was just a change of address? Oh, man, do I have the answer for you? For a lizard brain operating system, that is like the, the best news you could possibly get. It's the best product you can mm -hmm. possibly get. But we know from our higher brains that it's essentially snake oil. What do you think, Dred? Well, I was going to say that, uh, you know, for the 200,000 years that we have been homo sapiens, um we've been you know through that evolution we've been running on our emotions mm -hmm. and reason and and logic and uh skepticism are all very recent developments uh and take up maybe the last 200 250 years of that 200,000 year evolutionary train yeah. And so it doesn't come naturally to the human brain to reason and think these things through. Yes. And like David Hume says, uh, you know, uh, uh, reason is the slave to the passions. Mm. And the only thing that motivates us is our passions. And then we reason to justify it. 
Right. So of course, marketing is a targeting yes. the emotional triggers right. that make us then use reason to justify our choices rationalize through our passions right reason is a learned behavior you have to yes. learn how to reason you have to practice your reasoning you have it's to not practice something that if you yes. stop using for three years you're going to be just as good it's not a bicycle yeah. you have to constantly rigorously test it and that takes yeah. energy it takes a proper education and it takes proper uh training and it takes proper like practice rigorous practice it's a discipline and we're yes. not born out and of not just with yourself discipline. with other people Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it, it works best in a community where uh, people share those uh, skills so that you can hone them against each other and right. not just uh, independent. And everything that you're saying takes effort, like the energy well to be in a society where reason is touted as a discipline that people endorse and actually go through the process of training and uplifting is so rare just due to the fact that it's a lot easier to operate on authoritarian uh, authoritarianism or just strictly passions because mm -hmm. that's how we're that's our default state and if you're asking improvements you can make to humanity it'd be stuff like that like give us the ability to reason out of the gate why not why don't we have that larry what do you think it, it also takes a well-stocked baloney detection kit yes carl sagan uh brought that term into our lexicon uh through his book uh, a demon haunted world yeah Great but in other words, it's basically the tools of logic and uh, an exception. Uh, so I would recommend just doing a Google search for uh, the baloney detection kit by Carl Sagan and uh, also the rules of logic uh, and yes. learn those rules of logic will help you throughout your day to day life, making better decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, just to follow with uh, Larry's thing there, Skeptic Magazine actually produces a booklet called the baloney detection kit um which is just a couple bucks I, i've got like 24 of them that uh, when i come across somebody that looks like they're moving towards a more skeptical mental framework i give it to them as a as a, a means to bolster their skills and um, build them up in in that and it's a, it's a nice little pamphlet. And like I say, it's like a buck 50 or something like yeah, that. So. I just want to say, I find this conversation inherently prejudiced because my gender identity is baloney. <laughs> well, I'm a squirrel, so. Are you what they mean when they say squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Guys, um, let's see. One quick one. Uh, I had a weird term that I wanted to present. Maybe we'll talk about it more. <laughs> this is the idea of a person that goes to church or goes to mass and is still an overall terrible person once they leave uh, mass. And I call it a mass hole. Like, <laughs> please don't be a mass hole, right? I think we can say it on the radio. Like, Larry, you gave me the look, but like, I think that counts. It's a brand new word. <laughs> um, these would be my three rules uh, for whether or not you're a mass hole. One, just letting you know, you can be your religion. I have no problem with there being religions. I'd love for everybody to be their religion, but I don't want you to force your belief on other people. So please don't force your beliefs on other people. I'd also even, and in my opinion, I think even forcing your kid to go to like a Bible study or, or stuff when they're in that impressionable age constitutes as forcing your beliefs on other people. If you want to be the religion you are, good, but give other people the opportunity to like follow you. Don't encourage them as the sole loving authority figure in your life of what they should be and what they shouldn't be. I feel like that's a problematic situation, or at least give them the options of like what the full variety of tables are, or start with non-belief first. And then when they have a good reason to fall into, go for it. Because who wants to have all these believers that believe just by virtue of the fact that they were indoctrinated at a young age. Second one is don't inflict harm. Don't cause unnecessary harm. I'd throw its circumcisions into this not getting vaccinated, inhibition of sciences. Don't go out of your way to cause harm to other people. Prejudices, attacking different groups just because they believe different things that you do or practice love in a different way that you do, that's unnecessary. So forcing belief, inflicting harm. And then the third one and the last one is using your religion, your experience of mass to not be a good person. So like, oh, I don't have to, I don't have to, uh, 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 contribute to this charity because I prayed for them or, oh, uh, earthquake happened in here. I don't, well, I'll pray and then I'll go back to the rest of my life or 
uh, I don't have to think about bad things or the crimes that are happening or inordinate institutional racism or inflections of lack of privilege to people who wear pirate hats and can't right. necessarily wear them in their own driver's license because when I go to church, I'm a good person and I prayed and I know I'm okay. It's like, don't use your excuse to not be a good person and, and, and unilaterally offer those privileges to everybody. That's all mass holery. It's mass holery. <laughs> That's, you know, you, I'm not telling you to be a good person. I'm just saying, don't use your, your religion as an excuse to not be a good person. Cause yeah. that, in my opinion, is just another form of harm. Which is very common. Mm, very right. common so don't be a asshole that would be my takeaway <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. my final words dread pirate higgs what's yours uh well you can find my stuff on uh, mind pirate youtube channel m-i-n-d-p-y-r-a-t-e mm. -I -E. i've been doing weekly sermons on various topics uh i've seen them they're, <laughs> they're very short they're like th three and a half to five minutes long um just little snippets of uh you know, some personal reflections. And um, yeah, I think um, they're starting to get interesting because I'm starting to get into a groove. So uh, yeah, check it out. Of course, I live stream this uh, Sunday mornings for me at 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time and also do the uh, views on the news often at 11 a.m. Uh, Sunday morning. So yeah, check it out. So if you like it, subscribe. Nice. And Dread, looking forward to seeing latest updates on your quest for chaos now that you're yeah. and, and ready to go. Um, along with that, I just want to say, from my perspective, I do, I do think that we should think about um, religions and corporations in the same light. And whenever we're really upset about a corporation doing something really uh, against the consumers, we should also think, hey, what is religion offering us? And isn't this almost being run like a corporation? If that seems crazy to you, think about how people can follow a corporation as if it was a cult. Like in my opinion, in a sense, like Apple products tend to like operate within a closed ecosystem and, the, and they have a lot of fanatics. And if they were to suddenly come out with a charge per device that they sell just randomly, I think people would be upset by that. So why not for a dollar cost of like some Apple trillion dollar corporation, don't we get up? Why don't we get upset when a religion says, hey, by the way, um, we're going to need your kid to not get vaccinated, hate these groups of people, uh, vote for this politician when they become older. And on, oh, by the way, uh, you need to marry this kid. Like it can get really stark with how religions operate. And so I say, of course. think about that impact in the same context you would as an oracle corporation. Think of a religion as a corporation and if you abide by it still, then you buy by it. But if you don't, now we're thinking about it on the same level. Now you'll see it how an atheist sees it. Larry, final thoughts and what do you think? Well, excuse me, my content can be found at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for our radio show archives. We've got all 300 shows there, atheist songs and articles on the subject. Uh, my YouTube channel is at Doubter5. And you can find my book, Atheism, What's It All About, on Amazon. Oh, there it is. Dred's holding it up. And if you're having trouble leaving religious beliefs behind, you can get help from religion, uh, from recoveringfromreligion.org, that is. If you're a member of clergy, but have come to see that the claims of religion are not justified, there's if you're stuck behind the, the pulpit, as it were, uh, there is help for you at theclergyproject.org. Uh, actually, drop the the, and it's just clergyproject.org. Remember, everybody is going to some other religion's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life, and you'll see you next Wednesday at 7 o'clock here on WOZO Radio. Say bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.